There are countless conspiracy theories, which have been created over the years, regarding not only the coldest, but also the most remote, unforgiving continent on Earth, Antarctica. Countless tales of ancient civilizations buried in the ice, preserved like something akin to Pompeii, quite possibly complete intact ruins of an ancient, advanced, now lost civilization. Their lifestyles, buildings, even entire cities are claimed by a number of fringe researchers as a real reality. Cities buried miles beneath the ice in a state of perfect preservation. Although we feel this may be an unlikely possibility, there could indeed be undeniable evidence of a past existence still buried under the ice, if indeed they were there at all, for one can never really be sure about the Perry Reese map. Yet today, this is a very unforgiving place, even sparking the inspiration for arguably one of the best science fiction movies of all time, The Thing. Stories of UFOs crashing into this incredibly remote landscape, some in which we have covered in the past, focused in upon by the channel due to the fact that an expedition was indeed made to a particular anomaly, to a feature, one indicative of a high-speed crash into the frozen tundra. This site was successfully traveled to within what we presume would have been a mobile laboratory, clearly undertaken by a well-equipped group, one who clearly didn't expect others to have spotted the site via satellite also. So they can clearly be seen via satellite imagery arriving at said crash. A tremendous effort to make, at tremendous expense, thus, a strange effort for any known human-built craft, unquestionably made at great expense. Illogical for a man-made craft, even that of secret technology, but for an alien craft, such efforts could be logically argued as a realistic motive for whoever this team was funded by to make the mission to the site. And there are, indeed, undeniably, some rather intriguing stories which still hover around a number of still classified, still unreleased confidential files regarding events within the Arctic Circle. Claimed by a number of individuals who also claim to have been a part of said mission, a mission known as Operation High Jump was an event during a battle within the Arctic Circle with what could only be described as flying saucers. But alas, due to the fact that Americans have never publicly released any details regarding the operation, we can merely speculate. However, a story which surfaced on ancientcode.com, a website we have long supported as a superb source of antiquarian knowledge, a story accompanied by what we think, you will agree, are some of the most incredible images ever taken of UFOs, specifically unexplained anti-gravitational craft in flight ever captured. Available thanks to John Greenwald from The Black Vault, who in turn received the incredible images from researcher Alex Mistretta. According to the website, quote, The photos here displayed are evidence of a close encounter between forces of the United States Navy and unidentified flying objects on the edge of the Arctic Ocean in March 1971." End quote. Are we witnessing the destruction of anti-gravitational alien craft, an alien encounter, or, quite possibly, weapons testing events targeting reverse-engineered alien technology? The images are, according to said sources, from the mission USS Tripang SSN-674. Our postulations as to what these images reveal are based upon our own logically presumed direction, in which American and many other advanced military nations would take if one were presented with a crashed craft powered by said technologies. These military bodies would indeed pursue the reverse engineering of said technologies, then, secondarily, develop defense systems which were effective upon said technologies. These are, of course, merely mystery history's ponderings in regards to what these images could truly be showing us. And of course, said hypothesis could indeed be incorrect. Yet regardless, the question remains, then what do these images reveal? What are pictured within? Regardless of the purpose of the mission, we find the possible theories surrounding the photographs highly compelling. The Red Planet Although many people assume it to be the closest planet to our own, it is in fact Venus which comes closer to the Earth during its orbit around our star. Mercury is the closest planet not only to Earth, 
but to every other planet in the solar system at one time or another. Yet these giants barren landscapes incapable of supporting life. This reality is partly why Mars is so often the focus of man's attention in regard to our solar system's planetary bodies. With a partial atmosphere, and thanks to the Mars rovers, proven to possess water, it is a far less violent planet, not scorched like Mercury or filled with toxins like Venus. As such, for many years now, as the human population has exploded and modern technology has made self-sustaining, isolated life-supporting systems a reality, the search for suitable places for future colonization of the solar system has become a more and more popular subject of study. One of the most important additional factors for possible candidates for this exploration of space is the planet's distance from the Sun, nicknamed the Goldilocks Zone. Just like porridge being just right, Mars is located within a specific distance from the Sun capable of sustaining life. And although space agencies and other fields of funded institutions staunchly deny the possibility of it once having been inhabited, possibly even by man himself, dismissing such ideas as preposterous, Mars's desolate red oxide landscape is in fact uncannily similar to Earth's possible future appearance, if humans were to continue unsustainable activities or a cataclysmic event were to occur. Thus, is it so preposterous to ponder the possibility that the planet we see before us today was in fact transformed into its lifeless form by an event or possibly past insatiable appetites for its resources by an ancient civilization which once called it home. Could the Cambrian explosion, the sudden appearance of advanced life on our planet, be evidence of terraforming? Could there have also been a similar, yet now hidden, mammalian explosion, indicating our own sudden arrival here on Earth after it artificially became capable of sustaining us? An orchestrated introduction of a complex food chain by ancient man who were in reality Martians. We have in the past covered some very strange occurrences on Mars, one in particular suggesting that possible black operations to colonize the Red Planet are already underway. The Mars rovers were given an expected lifespan of just 90 days. This estimation was based upon the notorious dust storms which choke its surface. Yet spirit lasted an incredible seven years surviving until 2010, and Opportunity only recently ceased operation. This remarkable longevity, solely a result of what has become known as cleaning events, which for 14 years were repeatedly experienced and documented. Yet what is most curious regarding these events is that they always occurred while the rovers were offline. In July 2007, during the fourth mission extension, Severe Martian dust storms block sunlight to the rovers and threaten the ability of the craft's survival. However, when the dust storms lifted and the rovers came back online, something had cleaned them of nearly all debris. On May 1, 2009, during its fifth mission extension, Spirit became stuck in the soft soils of Mars. Strangely, it seems, because the rover was not moving, it missed subsequent cleaning events. Did our mysterious helper assume it had died? Join us in our next video, which will be an expose of artifacts, features, ancient testimonies and satellite anomalies, and many other factors which support the conspiracy of secret Martian inhabitation, supporting the hypothesis of an ancient Martian civilization that once called our red neighbor home. Evidential arguments we find highly compelling. In our last video, we discussed the possibility of there being a secret colony on Mars, a colony made possible by modern technologies, advances in sustainable agriculture and life-supporting artificial ecosystems, an apparent astronaut silhouette caught during one of the rover's unexplained cleaning events, and the resources such as water found upon the surface, making it an ideal candidate for such a mission. With running rivers, oceans, even possibly a thriving ecosystem, did we once call Mars home? If we did indeed once call Mars home, 
there would be undoubtedly ruins on its surface. Rare, surviving features that would still litter the landscape, and over the years, countless possible examples of these have been spotted. And although many of these could be dismissed as mere cases of pareidolia, others are just too perfect, too precise in their appearance to simply be dismissed. Possible ancient relics of a lost Martian civilization. Ancient sarcophagi, heads of statues, pyramidal structures discovered to match star constellations in their layout, most notably that of a Pleiades constellation located near the famous face on Mars. An enormous face often argued as having been nothing more than a trickery of light. This regardless of ancient texts, linking the face, the pyramids, and the constellational alignment to the burial requests of a supposed ancient Anunnaki king. Phobos is yet another curious anomaly of Mars, known to be in a continually decaying orbit. There are many features of this satellite which baffle astronomers and researchers alike. For example, when one calculates its orbit, they are shocked to find that this orbiting rock should have crashed into the Martian landscape many, many years ago. What's more, satellite imagery of its surface has captured images of a very mysterious anomaly on a number of occasions. A cuboid monolithic object with no impact crater resting upon its surface. Buzz Aldrin has even mentioned this anomaly, specifically calling it a monolith, also noting that he believed, quote, God put it there. Is Phobos's enigmatic orbit deliberate? A past attempt to draw our attention to it, subsequently discovering this monolith? Could it possibly hold undeniable proof of not only other life in the universe, but the past habitation of Mars itself? It is undoubtedly highly compelling. Habitation on the moon. We can visit other people with their habitation. We can keep track. If there's something very important to be developed from the moon, I'm not sure what it is right now. And I sure think we should identify what it is for America to make such gross expenditures again for human habitation on the moon. We can help. We can join with. Together we can explore the moon and develop the moon. We should go boldly where man has not gone before. Fly by the comets, visit asteroids, visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? The Crystal Skulls, a set of the world's most alluring artifacts, possessing the power to create religions, snaring many a Hollywood figure with their mysticism and rumored possible alien origins. Firstly, how does one tell a real crystal skull from a fake? There are always artists capable of making and selling things that seem old, says anthropologist Jane McLaren Walsh of the Smithsonian Museum. And she should know, Walsh has seen her share of fakes. In fact, she's probably seen more crystal skulls than anyone else alive, subsequently becoming the leading academic on the subject. A stern skeptic with a ruthless ethic, only the most puzzling will convince Jane. Another major player in the skull game, according to Walsh, was Frederick Arthur Mitchell Hedges, an English stockbroker turned adventurer, who in 1943 began displaying a skull at dinner parties which he called the Skull of Doom. His daughter Anna later claimed that he had found the skull in a ruined temple in Belize during the early 1920s. However, this was later found to have been a lie. Investigations by the Linnean Society of London a research institute specializing in taxonomy and natural history revealed that Mitchell Hedges actually purchased his skull at auction at Sotheby's in London in 1943. How it came to be at the auction house, however, was never established. Which is unfortunate because the Mitchell Hedges skull, according to Walsh's scrupulous examination, is the only one she has ever had to reluctantly confirm as an authentic crystal skull. What's more, it is the only academically accepted original known within the public archives. Smaller than other examples, which under microscope analysis were seen to have been made using rotary drills, 
The Mitchell Hedges skull is a more finely crafted, yet more crudely designed example that under the atomic microscope has shown signs of having indeed been an ancient pre-Columbian artifact, which sure enough was constructed using, quote, unknown technology. There are, of course, many examples of crystal skulls around the world, and many more stories surrounding their mysterious construction. Elongated examples, stories of groups of these skulls initiating some form of energy field. Ancient laser-cutting technology has also been claimed time and time again. However, we felt we would approach them from another angle, to experience the rare occasion when modern, specifically funded academic institutes buckle to overwhelming evidence, proofs given by the defeated skeptic to those who pursue nothing but the perplexing truth and a direction for study. Made from a single piece of quartz crystal, Mitchell's Skull of Doom is unquestionably an exquisite example of an unknown history here upon our planet. Regardless of beliefs, or indeed the superstitions which now surround them, there are a rare few which support the theory of lost civilization and ancient visitation. This skull is much smaller than many and crudely carved, leading museum scholars here to believe that in a world of fakes, this one is the real thing.